We want to thank you for inviting us. This is a very, very exciting year for the Ramona Bowl. We are, in case you've never been, we are a 5,443-seat amphitheater in the South Hills of Hemet. And there is no better place to watch an outdoor drama or an outdoor concert even on, on the summer nights than the Ramona Bowl. We've been there since 1923. Our first audience sat on rocks and, and the hillside. They were dressed to the nines, literally. They were in suits and hats and dresses and everything else that you wore back then when you dressed up. And they sat all over the hillside. So um, we're very excited that we are celebrating our 100th anniversary. We did get shut down during the, the, the pandemic, and prior to that, the only time we were shut down before that was the Depression and the 1942 when the World War II hit. So uh, that's why we call it our 100th anniversary, uh, because in five years we'll be, we'll be celebrating the 100th performance. How's that? <laughs> We, uh, we kicked it off by being in the Rose Parade this year, and it was quite an incredible appearance. Uh, I was in the office the next day. I had calls from all over the country. It was amazing. One lady called from South Carolina. She'd grown up in California, and she said, I'm coming. I'm bringing my three daughters. It's my 80th birthday in April, and I'm going to finally see Ramona. For those of you uh, that have friends who are 90 and over that want to come to see the play, we made it a policy on our 90th anniversary that all people who are 90 years and older are free. So they can, they, we figured they'd bring some family members, so there might be some paid tickets. But just remember that and but our... this year you have to be 100, right? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> we, we thought we'd be pushing it a little too far if we said you had to be 100 to be free. But, but basically... Uh, we really and truly are, are excited about this year, and we have a lot of comebacks. Our president's dinner on the 21st when we announced our cast, we had 21 Ramonas and Alessandres who returned. Um, so you will, you'll be in for a big treat because our, our cast is even bigger than it usually is, and it will be fun. But I hearken back to how did we all get started with this? How did it all begin? And uh, Deborah Don just posted something on Facebook this week for us. Um, Chief Standing Bear of the Ponca Indian Tribe, back in 1879, went to a meeting where the author of the book, Helen Hunt Jackson, and her writer friends, which I often call rock stars in their day, because what else did you have to do but read really cool books or really cool things? Uh, not a lot of theater back then all over the place, but you could always have a book. You could always depend on a book. So she and her rock star writer friends were at a meeting in 1879 with Chief Standing Bear. Uh, he had come to them because he knew they had influence in Washington and said, we need your help. We're being thrown off our land and we want your help because we know you have influence in Washington. Helen Hunt Jackson, who had been an author for quite some time, but she had had great tragedy in her life. She had um, lost her first, she was married at 21 to, to uh, Mr. Hunt, and, who was an engineer, um, and he was doing, um, he, he was real special. He was creating submarines and doing some real, real forward thinking things in the engineering world. But their first son died uh, before he reached a year old. And uh, then Mr. Hunt died of a submarine prototype test accident. Um, so she had a second son named, uh, and they, his nickname was Rennie, and Rennie and Helen Hunt Jackson survived for nine years together when they both got diphtheria, and she survived it, and he did not. So here's Helen Hunt Jackson uh, finding herself not only a widow, but she had lost her two children, and she was, was by herself 
Um, she had a lot of literary friends, a lot of literary associations that she had grown up with, very well educated. Um, so she began to pour herself into writing even more. And uh, the things that she wrote, she uh, was a person of the day that was a woman, of course, and women didn't often use their own names because they used pseudonyms or like she used the name Sachs Holm. She also wrote under the initials HH. So um, she got out there and she got out there quite prolifically. She, uh, uh, her mother had died when Helen Hunt Jackson was uh, 16 and she had died of tuberculosis and then a couple of years later, her, or I'm sorry, sorry, she was 14 then, a couple of years later her dad died of tuberculosis too. She was always fearful of health issues, especially in the New England states where it was so cold. So she had a doctor recommend that she go to Colorado for better weather which I think is pretty funny, because I lived in Colorado, and it's not that, that, that it's pretty cold in Colorado, uh, but it's probably as cold in Hemet as it is in Colorado right now. We've had this snow. But, uh, so she traveled to Colorado, didn't like it at first, went to Colorado Springs, and um, she found herself uh, taken by it, especially after, after the day she got in, it was very dreary, and then the next day, it, the sun came out and she had second thoughts and she did end up staying. She went back and got all of her stuff and moved to Colorado Springs. There she met uh, William Sharpless Jackson. Uh, he encouraged her to keep writing, encouraged her to continue meeting with her friends. And that's when she took a trip back east and she was at that meeting with Chief Standing there. Helen Hunt Jackson had been a woman that was didn't like women with causes. She d never had a cause necessarily that was taken up. So she ended up um, checking into this Chief Standing Bear's claim. And she was appalled. She was so appalled that she continued to look, check about it. It was happening all over the country, not to just the punk Indians, but all over. And she decided to write to all of the newspapers, everybody that would take a letter from her. She was writing to the Secretary of Interior. She didn't like him. She called him a blockhead and, and uh, a number of things, I'm sure more. If you read her, her letters, Indian reform letters, you will find that there's a whole lot more to it. And you'll hear more about that here in a minute. Um, but she decided to write a book chronicling tribes, and she chose seven tribes. She wrote this book called Century of Dishonor, and Century of Dishonor was a factual book, and uh, she handed it, she and her husband went to Washington, and they handed it to every congressman and senator in Washington, D.C., and uh, they didn't do much, but they did hire her to do a report on the Indians the Mission tribes and the Indians, not only in our area, but throughout California, the Southern California at the most. And she traveled extensively around here. You've probably heard of the stories of what she did down here, too. What she did in our area was extensive uh, with the Saboba tribe. They were being threatened to be thrown off their land. Uh, the teacher at the Noli Indian School, we have the oldest Indian school in California, is in, at Saboba, and it's still functioning. Kids come clear from Chula Vista to go to school there. And uh, Mary Sheriff told her, the teacher there said, Saboba's being threatened to be thrown off their land. And she was appalled. She telegraphed back, said, you need to do something. Of course, Washington, once again, didn't do much. Um, so she did hire an attorney with her own money, an attorney firm, to help Saboba remain on their land. That attorney firm eventually was used by the federal government to help form the reservations. Pechanga, in fact, Pechanga on their website uh, gives credit to Helen Hunt Jackson for there being a reservation uh, formed in 1882. Saboba's was formed in 1883. So there were things that came out of that reform um, uh, message that she sent to the government. It was a, a 
56-page um, report that she did. She had a gentleman named Abbott Kinney that traveled around with her, and Abbott Kinney was actually the gentleman who, who started Venice Beach. And uh, he was quite, quite the gentleman for the whole area, and uh, they, they have quite a story, too. Um, I want to tell you that out of all of this, she felt like she still didn't get through to the public. Some of the public read it, but they don't read a, a factual book like they read a fictional book. And she decided that she had it gathered all this information, gathered these names. There was Ramona Wolf. There's Ramona Lubo up at Cahia that has been claimed to be the, the real Ramona. There was a Ramona out in Ventura County also that she was associated with, uh, and she had come through there, and their tribe came and visited us, well, a member of their tribe came and visited us about a month ago, and we talked about that. But she had all of this information that she had gathered and pulled together, and she said it came upon her as if she were possessed. She said, suddenly, she said, I am going to write a book that will move the hearts and minds of this country. And that is when she decided to write Ramona. And she went to New York and rented in a rented apartment. And she had a lot of the things that she had gathered from tribes around here. And she sat down and she started December 1st of 1883. And she finished March 8th at 11 o'clock at night on March 8th. And that is a, if you've ever seen the book, I, I, have, all, I have all the books but that one with me. I <laughs> forgot to bring that one. It's a pretty girthy book. And she finished March 8th of 1884. Um, it was incredibly popular. Ramona was responsible for thousands and thousands of tourists that came to California. I recently uh, watched a video regarding the fact that this gentleman said that Los Angeles should erect a bronze statue beginning at the Cajon Pass and, and thanking Ramona and Helen Hunt Jackson for all that they did to develop into the tourist town that they were and uh, the many other things that happened in Los Angeles. So Los Angeles has a real thought about Helen Hunt Jackson. Ventura County does. Uh, we certainly do, because after she wrote that book, it was so popular. Everybody talked about it. Everybody did things that were Ramona this and Ramona that. And look at the streets that are named Ramona. Look at the Ramona Expressway. Look at the Ramona Town. Everything was Ramona all throughout those 30, 40 years. And in 1921, our communities of Hemet and San Jacinto decided to write a play and they hired a gentleman in, from Palm Springs. They actually went there to steal his ideas and instead they brought him back and hired him to write a play uh, and he chose the site where the Ramona Bell Amphitheater is today and that theater is so acoustically, acoustically uh, great when it comes to sound. We didn't even mic the play until the mid 80s. And we have anywhere from three to 400 people in the cast, depending on, mostly depending on the kids that we get. But the first play was performed, he started writing and working with them in 21, and our first play was reform, performed April 13th of 1923. And that play was, again, we have a picture of the first play with everybody on the hillside sitting on the rocks because they came by the thousands and thousands. So the pageant, we call it the Ramona pageant because it's a glorious and, and pageantry is all, all around. Although we've backed off of that a little bit because there are some people who thought we were a beauty pageant. <laughs> so we... Yeah, this, no, is that sexy Alessandro? Uh, that's, uh, well, when you got a sexy Alessandro like we have, you, 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 might, you might say so, Don't too. Don't forget to talk about him. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We, we women always talk about our Alessandro. Kind of We've got a wonderful, wonderful Ramona. Um, Deborah Dawn here is with me. She played Ramona a little while back. A little while back. Uh, she's now in the play on another, uh, in another role, but it's wonderful. And, uh, but our... But our 
True. Our, our Eli Santana is our Alessandro, and he has been traveling all over the world in concerts. And then he came back from Bangkok just for our Christmas parade. And then he was in our Rose Parade, and we'll talk more about him in a minute. But I, I think that once that place started, it was just abound, abounded with popularity. Uh, we've been working through it ever since, uh, doing it every year that we could. It shut down in World War II and shut down during the pandemic for two years. We thought we were only going to be off one year, but we were off two. So we came back somewhat last year, but we're coming back full speed ahead this year. And uh, I see someone is... Did it get cold? Ah, it, Mrs. Jackson. Oh. Oh. I, I, I didn't know that summons would work. Ah. I have been summoned, it's true. <laughs> Would you like a microphone? I don't know. Do I need a microphone? Probably not. Probably not. Ah. But you're such a lovely, light-hearted, and light-voiced lady. I'm sure you need one. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Who are all these people? From the oh. Am I in Temecula? Again? <laughs> all right. Well. It's all your fault that I'm here. <laughs> My name is Helen Hunt Jackson. And I have been summoned here to be interviewed by all of you. Yes. Oh, look at all of these pictures. How pretty. Oh. Oh. This is very interesting to me. Anyway, I have been summoned here to be interviewed by you all. Do you have any questions? Oh, good. Then I'll go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, I was interviewed by some young ladies who were journalists. And I thought, oh, this should be fine. I don't usually give interviews. And these two young ladies seemed perfectly trustworthy. And they were, they were lovely, and we had a wonderful chat. And it was only when I saw what they put in print, all of my secrets and stories, that uh, I decided I would not give interviews again. But you all look very trustworthy. I think I'll stay. <laughs> now, as Miss Laura Van Alsdale has told you. Yes, I know her name. She summoned me and I know her name. I've known her for a long, long time. And she has known me. I am here because I have my, for the last five years of my life, I have dedicated it to letting people know about the Indian situation. It was, it was five years ago that I attended the lecture by Chief Standing Bear of the Ponca Indian tribe. And when I heard of the atrocities that had been committed on the Indians, I, I, I felt I had to find out more about this. So I researched it and I found, when I went to the Department of the Interior, to the Library of Congress and other libraries, the Astor Library, etc., I found more and more accounts from clergy and officers in the, in the armed services. And I found that indeed these things he had told us were true. Not just true, but sad. I felt I had to do something. I am a writer. That is what I have done my whole life. I can't even remember when I did not write. My father was a writer. My mother was educated. My father told me, Helen, and she told my sister as well, he told my sister as well, write. The power of the pen and all, you must write. And whenever you have a question, write. So I started to write. I wrote to 
every editorial I could find. I wrote to congressmen. I wrote to other politicians. Uh, you know how that goes. Yes, it's all right. You can laugh at that. <laughs> and I was not really achieving much, so I decided I would write a book. Oh, but for, first, let me, let me ask you. As a writer, I started writing at a very, very young age. Would you like to hear the first poem I ever wrote, and it was to my father? Yes. 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 Sure. <laughs> oh, I have one affirmation here. Yes. Yes. yes? yes? Do I hear, see a few other nods? Yes. yes. Those of you other nods. All right. I shall read this. My dear papa, tis very long since I have had a vacation, and now I write a little song to move your heart's compassion. I'm tired to death of Latin, as you no doubt do know. I get on slow with practicing, alas, alas, how slow. I think it is but fair that I should have some rest, and tis my fervent prayer that you may think it best. I'm but a child and rather wild, as all the world doth know, and that is why it seems so dry for me to study so. That old brown book has such a look, it makes one sigh to see it. And only think how long twill take for you to drag me through it. <laughs> now, if you'll grant a resting spell, I think I then shall get on well. I would write more, but my thoughts are fled, and Mother says, now go to bed. I wish you'd answer this in rhyme, if you can possibly find the time. <laughs> Your affectionate daughter, <laughs> Helen. <laughs> I'm taking the fifth. <laughs> <laughs> and so, that is how I began. And right I did, many, many, many times. As I said, to newspapers and politicians, etc. Now, I ended up at some point putting all of these accounts that I found together and I, I put them into a book called A Century of Dishonor, as I believe Miss Osdale spoke of. And we handed this book to every congressman in Washington, D.C. And do you know what happened? Nothing. 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 I should have known a 359-page book would be far too much for any congressman. <laughs> But I did not give up at that point. I decided to continue my quest. I think I have to turn this over. Hmm. Ah, yes, there it is. But I wanted to read you a little bit from A Century of Dishonor so that you can understand exactly what I ran into, what I found. There's one instance here. It is, it's an account from the Senate committee. One of the squaws had escaped from a village and was crouching behind some low sagebrush. A frightened horse came running toward her hiding place, its owner in hot pursuit. Seeing that the horse was making directly for her shelter and that she would inevitably be seen and thinking that possibly if she caught the horse and gave him back to the owner, she might thus save her life. She ran after the horse, caught it and stood holding it till the soldier came up. Remembering that with her blanket rolled tight around her, she might possibly be mistaken for a man. As she put into the soldier's hand the horse's bridle, with the other hand she threw open her blanket enough to show her bosom that he might see that she was a woman. <laughs> He put the muzzle of the pistol between her breasts and shot her dead. And afterwards was not ashamed to boast of the act. This is an account 
from a Senate committee investigation. In another citation, the testimony of Major Scott J. Anthony, who was in charge of Fort Lyon to the southwest of Sand Creek, and a willing participant in the attack in 1864, he told this. There was one little child, probably three years old, just big enough to walk through the sand. The Indians had gone ahead, and this little child was behind, following after them. The little fellow was perfectly naked, traveling in the sand. I saw one man. Is that something important? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> ah, well. It's not for you to know yet. Yes. <laughs> nothing, nothing that's around yet. All right. All right, well, I'll continue this story about this little boy. I saw one man get off his horse at a distance of about 75 yards and draw up his rifle and fire. He missed the child. Another man came up and said, let me try the son of a... I can hit him. He got down off his horse, kneeled down, and fired at the little child. But he missed him. A third man came up and made a similar remark and fired, and the little fellow dropped. A small child. In a report of the Indian Peace Commission of 1868, they made this report. It scarcely has its parallel in the records of Indian barbarity. Fleeing women holding up their hands and praying for mercy were shot down. Infants were killed and scalped in derision. Men were tortured and mutilated in a manner that would put to shame the savages of interior Africa. And so you can understand why I decided to take up this cause. So for years I wrote, as I said, articles, I traveled, I did many things. And then one, in one place that I traveled, I found out about a trial that had been done where this man had been, had been accused of killing an Indian. His name was Sam Temple. This was in San Jacinto, California. So I looked into this trial. The trial was a total fiasco of justice. He was let go, free to go, because he was a white man who killed an Indian. Incensed by this and other tragedies, the, the barbaric, savage uh, things that happened in Temecula, I decided I needed to do something. I needed to really do something. My century of dishonor was written, it was published, it was out there, but people did not want to read serious books. They didn't. So what could I do? After hearing about this trial in San Jacinto, I decided I needed to do something that would reach the hearts and the minds of the people. And so, I decided to write a novel. And the novel I wrote was called In the Name of the Law. Have you ever heard of it? No. Oh. Oh, that's right, because it was changed. Yeah. It was changed to Ramona. I used all of the people and the places I had seen in Southern California, and I was as 
I believe Miss Arsdale, Van Arsdale, has told you I was incensed. I have, I was overcome. I was, I could not put down my pen. And I wrote the book. It was not long after that that, that I wrote a letter to the President of the United States. Ah, President Cleveland. And I wrote, <coughs> from my deathbed, I send you a message of heartfelt thanks for what you have already done for the Indians. I ask you to read my century of dishonor. I am dying happier for the belief I have that it is your hand that is destined to strike the first steady blow toward lifting this burden of infamy from our country and righting the wrongs of the Indian race. With respect and gratitude, Helen Jackson. That was my last work until now. <laughs> arriving here. I hope you don't mind that I've taken up some of your time to give you why I wrote this book, Ramona. I wanted people, yes? I'm so sorry, but if I may, just, just a word. Pardon me. I just wanted to introduce myself to you. You're so gracious for seeing us here today. I, I, for one, really, really appreciate it. I'm an actress. Ah, and what is your name? I'm Deborah Dawn. Ah, Deborah Dawn. Is that all one word? It is. It's one word. Oh, I see. That's nice. <laughs> it's kind of okay. like Marianne. Ah. But if I could just tell you, as an actress, I've done it for many, many years. No, no. no please don't please, go. Please, please. The pinnacle of my career. Mm. I've done a lot of stuff. Mm. But the best thing I ever did the highlight was to play a part in a huge outdoor amphitheater. Mm. And the words and the meaning and the message of the play is what made it so spectacular to be a part of something that this play had been going on for years and years. It was 85 years old, this play, when I did it. Oh my. And I stood up before thousands of people on this outdoor amphitheater with as loud of a voice as I could and still be in character, giving these words of this story and this message that has been passed down through all of those years. Now, you can imagine, all of those years, mm -hmm. it would have had to have been a spectacular message. Indeed. A spectacular work of art. And what was this play based upon? A story. Oh. It was a California story. A California story. Yes, that's I why see. I wanted to tell you about it. Oh. The impact mm. that it had. Mm. Because the author originally wrote it. And then maybe 40 years later or so, they actually made it into a play. So they took her book oh. and her spectacular story. Oh. And a story, by the way, yes. that changed hearts and minds. Not only in California. Mm, that's very nice. Right. Yes, as a writer, I can appreciate that. I knew you would. Yes, I knew you would. <laughs> and so what was the name of this book? Well, before I tell you that, yes. let me just tell you the impact oh. that it had. I, I mentioned the 40 years. Mm -hmm. It was actually a female writer. How marvelous. I know. It, those are my favorite kind. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Mine as well. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> well, she was the first literary author that was a female. And years and years later now, this year, mm. she is finally getting a literary landmark in California for all of her work. That's marvelous. It is. It is. It's going to be a huge celebration. Excellent. More so because it's also the 100th year this year 
And I, I'm not playing the lead anymore. I'm too old. Don't look at my crow's feet. Oh, dear. But I did. I, I, I played it 15 years ago. I see. And like I said, it was, it was an honor because there's this, there's this weight of those 85 years. Oh, my. And the people that came, I have to tell you, the people that come to this show, they do it every year. When I was there, there were people that I met, all the Spanish dancers, and there's Indians, and they come and they, they do their tribal dances. Mm. And there's cowboys, and they shoot their guns in the air, and everybody goes, ooh, ah. <laughs> It's amazing. Do you know, at, at many times in the past, there have been over 400 people, not in the audience, in the cast. Four hundred people. Wait, 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 wait. Let me tell you. Wait. It's it's on a hillside outside. Yes. I, I told you it was an amphitheater. Oh, so it's an outdoor. Yes. Experience. Which makes it that much better. Oh, Four hundred people. Yes, and the audience is thousands. Do you pay them all? Oh no no no. Oh. And that's what's remarkable, really. I mean, really, when you think about it. Mm -hmm. These four hundred people. Yes. Maybe a little less. It's certainly dwindled down in the last few years. But they're still coming. And these are families that set it aside in their schedule every year. They don't even question it for a second. They don't schedule anything else in because that's the year we're doing our show. Mm. Our tradition. It's part of our family. Why do we do it? Because we believe in the message of the play, of all of California. Mm. But we also believe in the family atmosphere that it has created within our cast. Mm. There are people returning, many of them, after 25 years. Every year they still come. After 50 years, they still come. The Spanish dancers, and they can still dance. That's probably why they can, because they keep doing it every year. <laughs> and then, get this. Yes. There is a family yes. that plays the instruments within the play. And their family began in year two. And the ones I'm performing with this year are the ancestors, five generations later, five generations. who still show up every single year and pass it down generation to generation. And the reason I wanted to tell you this, Miss mm. Jackson. Mm. Oh, please, do you have a tissue? No, no, it's because the message, mm. the impact, yes. the author never knew. Oh. She never knew the reach oh. that she wrote a book yes. and she changed the world. Oh. And why are you telling me this? Because she dies. Mm. She dies before she knows. Yes, it does happen. And what an opportunity that you're here today. Yes. <laughs> yes. I wanted to let you know that you're the writer and your book is Ramona mm -hmm. and we perform the play every single year for a hundred years and you have changed the world I Turn enlightened and overwhelmed. I, I have no other way to put it. Thank you, Miss Van Arsdale. And thank you all for listening to me. I appreciate it. And I'm sure Miss Deborah Dawn would love to see you all again. Is that right? Here, yes. Viva Ramon. Ah, a little bit of Spanish influence there. Huh? <laughs> well, thank you very much, and thank you all. Viva <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Helen Hunt Jackson, bravo. I, uh, I often wake up at night. I think I'm summoning you too during that time. I want to tell you this picture of Helen Hunt Jackson was done by a friend who is the artist who also painted that painting of our Alessandro. Sexy Alessandro. And our sexy Alessandro. <laughs> Even before the painting. Even before the painting. But she, uh, I asked her, I said, Susan, can you do paintings in color from black and white? So she said, well, if I get an idea of their color of their hair and their eyes, I'll try. One day uh, during the pandemic, she called me, and it was right when the pandemic had just hit. We didn't know whether we were going to get to do the 2020 uh, show it shut down we thought maybe it would be shut down for a month um, she called me and she said she's coming to life and she started in on this painting and um, she called me at, she did it in a day and the, and the next morning it's amazing she so must have worked like she, was possessed. she must have worked <laughs> like we all get possessed when we start working on things Ramona uh, whether it's the book the story uh, right now, there's a documentary being filmed that's going to be focused on Helen Hunt Jackson and her life. He was just down here at Vail Ranch to be talking about the wolves and, and the families here. It's going to be pretty amazing. Um, but we all get really consumed by Ramona and her story. This century of dishonor was an absolute amazing work that, that she did to try and tell that story and try to get them to, to do something. Um, when she passed away, it was only a year and a half after she wrote the book, Ramona, and that was your impassioned plea to her that uh, she didn't get to see the impact. When we were on the freeway at the Rose Parade at 4 o'clock in the morning, walking around the, the documentary filmmaker, and I were standing there looking at the overpass, because I don't know if you know it, but all the equestrian units have to line up on the 210 freeway. That's where they sleep the night before. That's where the horses are all misbehaving. One horse took off running away from the sheriff, and we were afraid he's going up on the freeway. Um, but Jason and I stood there at the bridge, and he said, can you imagine what Helen Hunt Jackson would think uh, of us. We're getting ready to be in this rose parade to be seen across not only the nation but the world, and that's what her book uh, accomplished. So uh, I do hope you'll come and visit us. We have some really uh, fun things at the bowl going on. We have a pre-show. Uh, Miss Deborah Don is in charge of it. And so you know it's going to be fun. Um, the other thing, we have a nice museum, and I want to tell you a quick story about this. Um, in our museum, it was kind of jammed in. It was small, and uh, uh, we had a gift shop and a museum crammed together. <clears throat> we had a donor that got a hold of me and wanted to find something for his client that was artsy. What do you have that's art up there? I know you have the play, but do you have anything artsy? Well, just... Six years before, we had the 90th anniversary, and inside our museum, when you crawl around the back and you go up the stairs, it's a, only five feet between this and a wall, and pretty soon you're looking up, and it's about as high as that ceiling, and there's this, what we thought was a painting, a mural, uh, went two stories, but about chest high down, it was painted over. Oh, wow. And um, what had happened is that that had been the ticket office many years ago when they first did this in 1942, and it had got all banged up. So one of the general managers made our museum curator, which I found out was a friend of mine's mother who was very distraught over having to paint on it. Um, and it was, it was messed up that way. However, we found out Milford Zorns is the one who did it, and he went on to become a very famous artist. And his work is commissioned in the White House. It was commissioned at the Library of Congress. He was world famous uh, after many, many years. And what happened was, this is a fresco. And a fresco is embedded in the plaster. And if you have a fresco, 
you have a chance of fixing it because you can take the paint off. It's painstaking. Mm. And for us, it was painstaking enough to cost right around $50,000. So we were trying to find a way to raise money to get it done. My friend's uh, client was very interested. They were going to meet with the daughter and son-in-law that were flying down from Sacramento. He got sick. She couldn't make it. And unfortunately, she died suddenly the day after. So mm -hmm. I thought all was lost. However, uh, my good friend that was the accountant and her client came back and not only helped us redo the fresco, but he did a million four in improvements throughout the courtyard, the upper parking lot, our electrical. Uh, that, that bowl sucks up a million four really fast. Mm -hmm. But we have a lot of improvements done, including a new gift shop so we can have room for a bigger, proper museum. And we hope you'll come and admire our fresco that has been renovated by an Beautiful. expert uh, in the field. And this is what you walk in and see. You kind of, they kind of blend in, but this is the daughter and son-in-law of the artist that, uh, that uh, came down. And they will be here on probably the second Saturday to visit with people about this. So this is another thing that came out of the pandemic that was a good positive thing. Um, but we are excited to show this off when you come. Let's show this one off. And this is, um, this is a, we did some of these. These are, um, that's the fresco also. And uh, these are thro woven throws that we uh, had made. And uh, beautiful. I love this. It's just a, the colors. It's like the perfect. colors and the and the dress. The, the dress. dress was the dress was cut off like right here. Why would you do Unbelievable. that? Unbelievable. <laughs> so anyway, we we really appreciate being able to come and talk to you about not only Helen Hunt. Uh, she's a, a love of many of ours. We are passionate about knowing so much more about her. If you think about a woman in the late 1800s that stood up and did this and was so ferociously passionate about what she did in the last only five years of her life. Um, it is pretty amazing. But what's even more amazing are the people like Deborah Don who come back every year. Uh, the only paid people in the play are the director, the Arias Troubadours. I have a picture of them, the family that's been playing. We do give them uh, some money when they come and play our director and our two leads. The rest are not compensated. They come for the love of the bull and the love of Ramona. So please join us this year. Um, I, I did mean to pass out some, some uh, tickets. Where do they, they're right there. We, uh, while, while I'm finishing up, Deborah Don will give you guys each a ticket and we're gonna draw it for a pair of tickets to come to the play. Oh, so cool. um, the, the yeah, one I thing, she's Boxed in here. Sorry about that. Oh, that's Sam Tipple. This is, Sam this is the this guy. Is the bad guy. The so if you come to see the show, yeah, you boo him. That's that's your He's job. He's the guy who shot uh, the Juan Diego, the oh. Indian that she talked about. But what is amazing, and I need to make a picture of that, mm -hmm. is how much he looks like our Ferrar in the play. It's uh, and I don't it's see him. I don't think we have one of Ferrar. Of no, Danny. Yeah, it's so. But it um, is amazing. And then uh, also, it's amazing about our beautiful Eli Santana, who plays Alessandro. He looks just like Eli Santana. We're, if you go like us on our Facebook page, Ramona Bull Amphitheater. Uh, what amazes me on these things, he looks so much like she's standing there. Uh, oh, we have a picture the of The one him. that Helen Hunt Jackson first yeah. heard that. Yes prompted her into action, even though she didn't like women that had a cause. Right. <laughs> and Eli, I stuck a picture up of him. He was in um, Westworld and some other uh, shows that he's played native uh, parts in. And this picture of him in Westworld, and I looked at Chief Standing Bear because Standing Bear just got a uh, bronze statue in Statuary Hall in Washington, D.C. And each state can put a statue in. Nebraska put Chief Standing Bear as a representative for them, which was amazing. But the picture of Eli and Chief Standing Bear side by side was uncanny. So we, we, have, we have a lot to, that we look at and are amazed at. Um, 
the uh, the other thing is is when you come this year we're opening our gates an hour early so we're opening at 12 30 we've got a lot of festival things going on pre-show and uh, you're welcome to come early uh, come later whatever you want uh, but we do open the gates into the amphitheater at three so the show starts promptly at 3 30. Um, the play usually goes till right about between 6 and 6.15. If the horses are, are, are not doing their part as quick as they should, we, <laughs> we take a little longer. Just pass it down. April, April and I have uh, all the brochures and stuff with us, uh, April 22nd and 23rd, then the 29th and 30th, and the 6th and 7th. They want to see this one because it has all of our info on there. Right. Those and are I've updates. got flyers for you. We'll, we'll get those right up. Oh, and tell them about the logo for the 100th floor. Miss Deborah Dallin <laughs> did the logo. <laughs> <laughs> I shot the brochure. We were trying to think of logos and hundreds. Oh, it was so fun. I feel so honored yeah. that you guys were with this. And Lori has made another one of the throws that's the logo. So we'll be selling those in the gift shop also. Right. These yeah. throws are real fun to get made. Yeah. I don't know if you've ever done them. So you have flyers? I do. Okay. I do. In fact, if you see my turquoise yep. bag, that's where they are. If I can get to it. Okay. All right. And then we'll, we'll have a drawing and see who gets to come for free. And even if you don't, our prices are pretty reasonable. We've moved back to the pre-COVID prices to 28 to $35. So they're, they're pretty reasonable for that. No, it's the ones that I... What did the, you the opening day, uh, opening day we are doing a, the literary landmark ceremony because we had applied for this and the Libraries uh, for America, uh, their uh, national association had given us the designation of, of literary landmark for Helen Hunt Jackson and that will be the first day and it will be uh, about 45 minutes prior to the opening of the show. I'm not used to this. I'm not used to being Vanna. So um, you might want to take those tickets and just put them in your pocket to throw away later. Because I think I gave out both sides of the ticket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, that happens uh, when you don't know what you're doing. Sorry about that. Okay. Oh, goodness. Okay. Okay. She is not blonde. <laughs> Forgive me, all you blondies. <laughs> we'll do this all over again. Here you are. you are. But you just did it again. No, they're right here. I got them. I got the other half. I mean, it only takes me once or twice. Then I learned. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And she's the one who's going to draw the ticket, so she better get it right this time. <laughs> Could be. Okay. Now, Miss Gebberdon, you're the one who's going to draw the winning ticket. That's <laughs> Okay. Okay. I thought I was ahead of the game, but I was not. Sure. Oh, down in San Diego. Yes. Uh huh. It's still there. It's still there. I was just down there. They were renovating the building, but it's still there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But oh, there were there were thousands. There's a book. Um, this book. Yay! Looks like Mindy's. Uh, this is a book about the Shelly. tourism Shelly. that it created. Lots of information about the thousands of people, thousands that came to California because of Ramona. In fact, the one uh, that I was talking about, LA should uh, mount a a uh, bronze statue at the Cajon Pass, he said that the, the uh, trains had just been finished to San Francisco and then into Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And there was a fee of $1 for 
from Iowa to Los Angeles is what you had to pay to get to Los Angeles. And they, they touted Ramona and everything about Ramona, too. All right, Deborah Dawn. All righty, so while we're waiting for this to happen, uh, it's hard to find good help, isn't it? Oh. Um, <laughs> so there's going to be a festival. Did I already talk to you about that? Did we already mention that? We did. There's a pre-show and there's a festival, and they're gonna. It's gonna be like a walk-through time with people selling their wares from the actual time period, maybe giving examples. If I had my wish, it would be like people making uh, beads from the tribes and that sort of thing, and talking to. Uh, everybody about how they did it and how they did their basket weaving and their tortilla making and all those other things. So, I want to see everybody there at the festival. And if you come opening day, we are actually having the ceremony for our Helen literary Jackson. landmark. And you'll Correct. probably see Miss Hunt again because you're going to conjure her. I think I will. I, I, I'll, I'll leave her rest until then. Okay. I'm not sure how you do she that. She gets a little grumpy when I conjure her too much. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You know, she's very stern with her, with herself. She can really make you feel little. <laughs> okay, so okay. Um, I'm drum roll, anyone? No? Okay. Okay, just one? Okay. Okay, let's do two. I two can't. sets of two tickets. Do have readers? Oh, she, oh, oh. I told you I'm She's giving old it to now. the old one to read. The number is 043. 254 three. Two, four, three. There you go. You get tickets. Yay. You're coming. We got it. We got to get your your address and everything. We'll send you tickets. Are we ready for another one? Yes. Okay, you have to read it. <laughs> I, I can't believe she gives it to me. 047. So the last three. Two five four zero four seven. Oh, all right. Dang, I got it. I mix these up better. No wait, are we done? Let's we give done? one more set. Okay, one more. We're gonna okay. go for this one side. One more this set. One. You better grab over there. One more. One Just more I set. I talked her into it. In yeah. the 50s. In the fifties. <laughs> oh, it's this one. Okay, ready? Oh, <laughs> it's only funny three times. <laughs> Is it not? Two five four zero four eight. It is. It's great. Do it again. Do it again. Okay. 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 okay now really do oh, five. five, five. Did you know there was two together when I did that one? Close your eyes. Yeah. Oh. Two five four zero five one. Yay! Oh. Okay. We tried. We tried so All right. Hard. But so maybe they'll bring you. If all three of you winners would uh, give me your address, then we'll get these sent to you. Okay? And they will be vouchers so that when you get there, you can pick your seat or you can call in and they will exchange them for your seat assignments. Okay? So each one of you will get two tickets. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.